Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk today about a uh, work that started uh, when I was then in my PhD with uh, Shafi, who was my advisor, and Guy Rothblum, who was a fellow uh, graduate student at the time, on uh, doubly efficient interactive proofs. And let me start by saying that I want to kind of emphasize again the approach that uh, Yuval and Amit took yesterday that I want to continue uh, today, which is the modular uh, uh, approach uh, so for obtaining SNARGs. So the goal of this you know, entire workshop is to talk about zero-knowledge proofs and succeed zero-knowledge proofs. And uh, what, the way I want to ap approach and the way we approach it in this work, and which I think in general is the way to, to go, is to try to do things in a modular way. So in other words, try to understand the simple information theoretic kind of part of, of your protocol and only then apply the cryptography. So this is kind of how we're, we're going to do it uh, in this work as well. So the starting point of our work was just the notion of interactive proof defined in the mid-80s by uh, Shafi, Silvio, and Rakoff, independently by Babai. And the goal here, right, you have just an interactive proof, a prover and a verifier. You want the standard completeness and soundness. Uh, the important thing, though, with this model of interactive proofs, when it was, uh, first came about, the idea was that you want to see how expressive, how, which computation can you prove to a polynomial time verifier. The runtime of the prover, nobody cared. Okay, it wasn't an issue. Uh, so you say, oh, the prover can be all powerful. This is an information theoretic model. You want to make sure even an all powerful prover cannot convince a polynomial time verifier. And they showed actually all P space computation can be uh, proved to a polynomial time verifier. But the important thing I want to point out in these results it's not just that the prover can be all powerful, he is very powerful. So in order to prove that, uh, you know, a time t in space s computation uh, outputs some value, the prover in these protocols, the runtime of the prover, is 2 to the space squared. So it's much more than a polynomial blow up uh, in the prover's runtime. So these are really only theoretical results. There are no, there's no way these can be implemented. Or, or, um, so the prover here runs in more than polynomial blow up in the original computation, often exponential blow up. Okay. So this was kind of the starting point of our work. And, uh, and when, again, when at the end of my uh, graduate studies at MIT, uh, Shafi suggested to me and, and Guy the, fo the following problem, a very natural problem. Said, wait, uh, you know, it's, this blow up is, is, is unrealistic. Let's try to come up with an interactive proof where the, there's no blow up. So let's even focus on polynomial time computations. I don't care about all P space. Let's focus on polynomial com time computations. And, what we want is the verifier to its runtime to be not much more than the actual time it takes to do the computation. And the verifier should be efficient, ideally as efficient as like reading the input and not much more than that. Uh, so that was the goal. The focus was on polynomial time computations, also known, we called it interactive proofs for muggles, like the prover is a muggle. He himself is only polynomial time, but he wants to just prove things to a very, very uh, kind of super, super efficient verifier. Okay. Uh, but you can think of this result, which I'll refer to as GKR, uh, a, as uh, proofs actually for any computation. So here's a general goal, right? You want to say, I have any computation. I want to make sure that the prover uh, uh, runs in time, more or less like the time it takes to do the computation, and the verif verifier is extremely efficient. Let's say something like the input size, not much more. That's the goal. And by the way, it's still an open problem to characterize which computations have a, a such a what we call doubly efficient interactive proof. Doubly efficient meaning all, both the verifier and the prover have efficiency constraints. And uh, in particular, does it contain all of, let's say, linear space computations? So this is still an open problem. Uh, let me, there's two works, two main works, theoretical works in this regime. So the first one was the work uh, with Shafi and Guy, GKR, where we, the, we constructed interactive proofs uh, doubly efficient interactive proofs for bounded depth computations. So if you think of your computation as a circuit, uh, the runtime of the verifier is proportional to the depth of the circuit. Okay, again, circuits are non-uniform models, so you need to think of a uniform variant of it, but let's put that aside. Uh, so this was in 2008. In 2006, and there was still the, that was the only thing we knew uh, for doubly efficient interactive proofs. And in 2016, 
uh, Reingold and the Rothblum brothers define, uh, constructed a doubly efficient interactive proofs for bounded space computations. Uh, so doubly efficient for bounded space sounds great, but the, run, the verifier's runtime, we would want it to be just proportional to the space, but it's actually proportional to the space plus the runtime t to the epsilon. Okay, so uh, for, uh, it's still only good for polynomial time uh, computations. Uh, okay, so for the um, uh, complexity theorists inclined people in this audience, I just want to mention, it's interesting, these two results are really kind of incomparable. Uh, you can convert any depth D computation to a space D computation, roughly speaking. But the blow up, when you do this conversion, there's exponential blow up in the circuit size. So there's a two to the D blow up. So even though uh, we know that IP equals P space, think of the depth model and the space model in this regime of polynomial time verifier, these two models are, are actually incomparable. Okay, but today I want to focus on the, on the GKR work, uh, uh, mainly uh, first because I was asked to, and, uh, and second is <clears throat> because uh, this work Amazingly, proves itself very useful. There's a lot of implementations. Actually, there's a, a one by Yu Peng and his co-authors that just came out a few weeks ago on, on ePrint. Uh, so it seems like these are still coming. Uh, very, very beautiful works, and I'll kind of try to uh, guide you all. So the plan, my plan for this talk is to give you a little bit of a brief kind of overview on what GKR does, and then I'll show you kind of how it took a life of its own and kind of a uh, high level idea of how it's been used to construct SNARGs. Okay, any questions? Okay, so let's uh, start with the GKR. So here's the GKR blueprint, the high level idea. Okay, the prover, say I'm the prover, I take my circuit, I wanna prove to you, let's say that some circuit on input X, X1 up to Xn, I'll put some value, let's say one. Here's what I do. I compute the, all the gates of the circuit, I compute the entire circuit on input X, and I, I wanna think of it for simplicity as a layered circuit. And what I do, I encode each layer using a linear error correcting code. Actually, I use a specific encoding scheme that's called low degree extension, we'll see it in a minute, but for now, just I use a linear error correcting code to encode each layer. And then what we do is uh, we, run, a, we, the protocol runs in phases, and in, actually in D phases, like the depth. And at each phase, we run a little local kind of uh, protocol, where, so from the top phase, let's say I, could, I argue that the output is one. We do a little protocol that depends only on the top layer and the uh, one, before, one below the top layer. At the end of the day, at the end of this protocol, I give you a value, some value, at one point in the low degree extension at the encoding of, of the D minus one layer. And the guarantee is, if the output that I gave you, one, is false, then with very high probability, the value I gave you for V, v D minus one, the value I gave you in the layer below, is also false. That's the guarantee. And we continue, we do another local protocol. And it has the guarantee that if VD minus one was false, then VD minus two is false. The value you get for the layer of D minus two is all false, so false. And that's how we, this protocol can, consists of D layers. At the end, you get the guarantee that if V2 was false, the value that you get for layer two was false, then also the layer you get for layer one with high probability is also false. But the layer one is just and encoding of the input. So you can check that on your own. You have your input, you can very efficiently check you know, what, if the value of that place in the encoding is V1 or not, and you accept or reject accordingly. So, so you can do this on your own, and the guarantee you get that if you started with an output that's incorrect, you know, still with high probability, V1 will be incorrect, and therefore you reject. So this is the high level overview of the protocol, what's missing then, and I need to tell you, is what does the local, a, so what does the local uh, protocol looks like? So any question before I go to the local protocol? Okay, so how does the local protocol, the local protocol is essentially, we essentially run the sum check protocol. So for those, so let me explain a little bit more. A, okay, what do I need to prove to you? Let's consider, for example, the sum check protocol between layer D minus one and D minus two. 
I know that, v, that VD minus 1, because I'm using a linear error correcting code, it's just a linear combination of all the values of the D minus 1 layer. Now, let's suppose for simplicity that the gates are all addition gates. Okay, we, we have two cases. The case, we assume that either all the gates are addition or all the gates are multiplication for simplicity. Suppose they're all addition. If they're all addition gates, then VD minus 1 is also a linear combination of all the values in layer D minus 2 because it's addition gates. Okay, so now we got kind of from, level, from layer D minus 1 to layer D minus 2. So now, what do I need to prove to you? I need to prove, I, I, I'll write it kind of in uh, algebraic form, uh, which will maybe look weird, but it really gives you a kind of calls for the sum check protocol. So I need to prove to you that some value of z, which is vd minus 1, equal the sum of all the elements, some sum, some weighted sum, I omitted the weights, of all the elements in layer d minus 2. Now, if I, if I think of the elements in layer d minus 2 encoded via low degree polynomial, then I can apply the sum check. So let me explain. I want to think of all the elements in layer uh, d over 2 as I want to think of all the elements kind of lying here in the small cube h to the m. And I want to take a function. I want to take a low degree multivariate, low degree polynomial f that agrees with the elements in layer d minus 2 on this, um, on this uh, uh, small cube h to the m. Just kind of extends that cube. This is, oh, sorry, that shouldn't be here. Uh, okay, well, it is. Ah, sorry, doesn't go back. Okay, there we go. Okay. Okay, uh, so this is exactly what we call the low degree extension. And once we have, we can think of the elements in layer VD minus 2 encoded via a low degree polynomial, we can really apply the sum check protocol. So I don't want to explain really what the sum check protocol is, it's not relevant, but the point is it allows us, it allows us to compute a big sum where the elements of the sum are values of a low degree, a multivariate low degree polynomial. So we just put kind of all the elements in layer VD minus 2 kind of encoded in this low degree multivariate polynomial so we can run the sum check protocol. The one thing I want to say about the sum check protocol is at the end, we need to verify, what does the verifier need to check? He needs to check that some polynomial GM given by the prover agrees with the function f on some random point t1 star to tm star. So what he needs to check is, um, <clears throat> is he, he, but he doesn't know f on t1 star to tm star. This is exactly going to be the value vd minus 2. So stepping back, I, again, this is very high level. I didn't give the details, but just to, for you to have kind of a high level idea, we have value vd minus 1. We run the sum check protocol. At the end of the day, to verify the sum check protocol, the, the verifier needs to know some element vd minus 2 to check an element vd minus 2 in layer d minus 2. How does he do that? Again, we go, we kind of continue uh, to the next sum check protocol and so on. So we have kind of protocols for checking. We use the sum check protocol for checking v, uh, layers in d minus 1, two layers in, v, in d minus 2, then d minus 2 to d minus 3, etc. So this is the high level idea. What's important here is that the sum check protocol has, is very efficient, has very efficient uh, guarantees. The runtime of the verifier is going to be uh, like poly log s or poly logarithmic in the number of sums. S here is the size of the circuit or the size of a layer. Uh, so it's poly logarithmic in the, the size of, of a layer. Uh, it, also, the number of rounds is poly logarithmic. And the prover runs only in time poly s. Okay? So we have kind of the, the guarantees. And again, I know this is an applied workshop. I'm being sloppy here with uh, poly and so on because it's not relevant at this point. This was kind of a general kind of theoretic results. And uh, all the follow-up works kind of made it, uh, you know, improve the parameters and made things uh, very efficient. Okay. So, <clears throat> okay. So let me just mention, so far we talked about if it's addition gates, we can just apply some check. If it's multiplication gates, things are more complicated because then 
the element in Vd minus 1 is a sum of products, because it's multiplicative, it's sum of products of elements in layer D minus 2. OK, uh, so it, you still run the same sum check protocol, but then it reduces to verifying two elements in the next layer instead of one. So you know, for those who are not familiar, it may seem, oh, this is a problem. You go from one to verifying to two, and then you may go to four and eight and so on, which is problematic. But it's not really. So in GKR, we get around it by using what's known in the PCP literature as the two to one trick. Uh, but I also want to mention for those experts in the audience, uh, actually, you don't even need to do the two to one tricks if it annoyed you too much in the implementations. You don't really have to do it. You can actually continue with two sum checks if you want. And things don't blow up if, you, if the verifier uses the same randomness in the sum check. So if you just continue with two sum checks with the same randomness, you'll have in each kind of local computation, you'll need to just ver verify two sum checks, two sum checks, two sum checks. It won't blow up. So OK, so uh, that's all I wanted to say kind of about, about the uh, GKR protocol. Uh, I don't want to give too much details because I don't think it's uh, very relevant um, for, for this crowd. I want to point out that the verify runtime and communication grows with the depth of the circuit. So it really seems like it's only useful for shallow circuits, this entire approach. OK, uh, any questions? Because I don't want to talk more about this protocol. Yes, so Ariel. I don't understand. You're saying when it's a multiplication layer, you can reduce to two sum checks? I, I don't you say another sentence about yeah. how you do that? Sure. So, uh, sorry. Yes. So, um, in a multiplication layer, when you do a sum check, you essentially do sum of products. So, at the end, of, because it's multiplication, so you have like sum of products of layer D minus 2. So, at the end of the day, you'll need to verify two elements in layer D minus 2. Because the, if, if you look at V D minus 1, you'll have sum of all the elements in layer D minus 1 because it's a linear coding. But each one is a product of elements in D minus 2 because it's multiplication. So you get a sum, a huge sum of products of elements in D minus 2. So now when you, if you look at the sum check protocol, then you need to verify two ele a, a product of elements in layer D minus 2, namely two elements. And now how do you verify two? So you, you don't want to just blow up, It'll go from two and then four and so on, right? So in GKR, we had this two to one trick by using lines and blah. So that's one way. But actually, I just want to say you don't need the two to one trick. There's other ways to go around it. OK? OK. OK. So, so your other way is something about using the same language? Yes. That's the only idea. So the other way says if you have two, if you need to verify two, num two values, and you, val you, do you just do two sum checks in parallel, but you use the same randomness, in both cases, you'll, you'll, in this sum check and in this sum check, you'll end with the same verification point. So it's going to be two, but it's going to be the two same points. That's, kind of a, that's a property of the sum check. That analysis works out. And actually, we needed that for, in a f very recent work with Lisa Yang and Omar Panet, we used this property. It was actually helpful for us, because the two to one trick in that work made a man. It's always two. It's always two. Yes, yes. OK. So, OK, so so far, what did we see? We saw uh, uh, doubly efficient proofs for low depth computation. <coughs> OK, I hope uh, you were impressed. But let me just point out, <laughs> no zero knowledge guarantees. You know, this is a workshop about zero knowledge. Uh, only for the, not only no zero knowledge, it's only for P. I mean, it's only for bounded depth. It's not even for NP. So uh, there's a huge leap of why, why is this relevant for, for this workshop? Or how did they construct, uh, how did you guys construct SNARGs out of this? So OK. so. Now I want to explain a little bit more about how this is used, this kind of blueprint for the, the, the goal, again, of GKR was just it was, we had no secrecy in mind. OK, wasn't, that wasn't the goal of that work. The goal of that work was just to do efficient verification of computation. So now I want to show you how you use this to get NP delegation and, 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 uh, and, and uh, with zero knowledge guarantees. 
So before we go to, and, and also I want to mention one thing, that this protocol, again, there's no crypto, there's no, it's information theoretic, it's secure against an all-powerful cheating prover. Okay, so the crypto didn't come in yet, but neither did the zero knowledge. Okay, so now I want to show you that actually the GKR blueprint, even though it was used for deterministic low-depth computation, it can also be used for NP. So let me explain how it can be used for NP. So if we have a witness, if we want to do a computation where there's an input X and a witness W, one can say, okay, look at the witness X, look at the witness W, let's do the same thing. Let's con construct the circuit. By the way, I moved from, low, from uh, error correcting code to low degree extension. This stands for the low degree extension. That's the actual uh, encoding that we use uh, that's, that's compatible with the sum check uh, protocol. So take this uh, blueprint of, of GKR, just use it with input and witness, and now run, you know, prove it. So run the GKR protocol, great. The problem is, remember that at the end, the verifier checks that V1 on his own. And now the verifier, it's a problem, the verifier doesn't know the input because he doesn't know the witness. He only knows X. So he can't, he doesn't, he can't check an element in the encoding on its own. So what do you do? Well, one option is the prover ahead of time can tell the verifier, here's the witness. Okay, now they run the GKR protocol and now the verifier can check on its own. That works. However, the problem is the witness can be large and we want efficient verification. We want the verifier to verify efficiently more in time less than the witness size. So he can't just get the witness. So what, what do we do? So the observation is actually the verifier doesn't need the entire, no, the, he doesn't need the entire input. He just needs the input and a single point on V1, right, to check. So he needs, he doesn't need the entire input. He needs to know to compute the, the encoding on a single input. And but a single point is not fixed in advance. It's a single point that is not fixed in advance. It depends on the verifier's randomness. And the, if the prover uh, knows this point, then he can cheat. So it's problematic. Okay, he can't then just give him that point, because then he can cheat. But I'm just saying, uh, so the prover does need to give him the entire witness, okay? But the verifier needs to check this witness only on a single point. So I did here, by the way, a leap. Uh, he needs to check on a single point in the, ex in the encoding of X and W, but the, this linear encoding has the property that if you know X, you just, it's kind of, it's, uh, it's like, an, it's, it's linear. So you can only, you only need, if you know X on your own, you only need to check a single point and the low degree extension of W, okay? So you, the verifier needs to check, so the, it's not the prover needs to give W, but the verifier only needs to check W on a single point. So if, uh, for those who, uh, you know, it may sound familiar, it may kind of smell like PCP. You know, the prover needs to give the entire thing, the verifier needs to check it only on one point. So now let me take a little bit of a detour and mention the interactive PCP model. So this model came, came about right before uh, uh, the GKR uh, work. And here the goal was to get more efficient PCPs. Okay, one of PCPs that are shorter. And we note that, oh, if you just use a PCP, they must be very long, or it seems like they need to be very long. So together with Hanraz, we said, what if we allow PCP and some interaction? And the goal was then to get a much more succinct uh, PCP. Okay, so again, in the, in the interactive PCP, the uh, prover gives a short, I mean, uh, ideally a short PCP, and then they interact a little bit, and, the, the, and at the end, the verifier needs to check you know, a few locations, maybe one location, the PCP, and decides whether to accept or reject. So it's a hybrid between the PCP model and the interactive proof model. The reason I'm bringing it up is note, okay, GKR actually gives us an interactive PCP for NP. Why? Okay, the prover will send a low degree extension, or the encoding of the witness ahead of time. They run the GKR protocol. At the end, the verifier only needs to read the, the PCP, the, the encoding of W, at a single point. Okay, so it's, it's true that GKR, the, uh, as an interactive proof, it only works for deterministic computation, but as an interactive proof with a PCP, it works for all of NP. 
Okay, so let me just mention, it's not quite, almost. Uh, this is, if you do just like this, it won't be sound. Uh, the verifier also needs to check that this encoding satisfies low degree property, but this we can do using low degree test. It's kind of um, the bread and butter of, of the PCP uh, literature. So there's one extra ingredient, which is a low degree test, which I don't wanna talk about, which you need for soundness. Okay, but now comes, uh, so so far again, even in the interactive PCP model, no crypto, it's a kind of, that's the um, a modular approach. Now, let me show you, actually, one can convert any interactive PCP to zero-knowledge proof. And here comes the compiler. Here comes the crypto. So far, there was no crypto. How do you convert any, and here you don't need to just look at uh, GKR, take any uh, interactive PCP uh, proof where the messages of the verifier are random. That's important. And I didn't mention, but I want to mention, that in GKR and in the sum check, all the messages that the verifier sends are com just random, like uh, just as p random coins. So random messages don't, don't depend on anything. Okay, so now how do we convert this into a zero knowledge proof? Well, this is kind of standard. What we do, the, verif the prover will commit to the PCP. The ver the, um, he will commit, uh, instead of sending the message in the clear, he will commit to all his messages. And at the end he will prove that if you open the commitments, everything uh, uh, would be, would, would verify, but he will prove in a zero knowledge. So you commit everything and you give a zero knowledge proof that what you committed to was, uh, v would verify. Okay? So this will give a, a zero knowledge proof, uh, but when we commit to the PCP, if you just use a, uh, a, a statistically binding commitment, it will be very large, uh, like the length of the PCP, but actually you can use it to get a succinct zero knowledge argument where it's secure against only uh, polynomial time uh, cheating prover by compressing the PCP. The PCP. So instead of, in the, when you commit to a PCP, instead of taking a large co a commitment that's statistically binding, take a shrinking commitment with a local opening. So one way to do that is like take a tree, uh, um, via Merkle uh, trees or a tree commitment. In practice, they, they have a more, more efficient ways of doing that. But that's just as an example. And then at the end, you're given uh, zero knowledge. Now you need to give an argument of knowledge. Okay, so you need to prove that you know, because it's a shrinking commitment, you need to prove that you know elements of the, that, of, uh, of the PCPs that you committed to and would give uh, the correct, and, and would be accepting. So this is a general transformation that converts any interactive PCP to z succinct zero knowledge arguments. Can okay, good. So, uh, uh, yes. So I meant to get to that later, but I'll, ask, I'll say now since can we test. Uh, so note also that, uh, uh, so, you know, let me just uh, show this and I'll talk about round complexity. So, um, so note, now we have, this is the basic idea of a succinct zero knowledge uh, argument based on GKR. So how does it work? You first commit using a shrinking commitment to the low degree extension to the encoding of the witness. You run the GKR protocol uh, uh, in D phases, so d essentially D rounds. Uh, and then, as I said, you also need to do the low degree test, which I didn't say what it is, but it's kind of a very simple uh, thing. And so the verifier sends his query for the low degree test. And then the prover gives a zero knowledge proof proof of knowledge that the low degree test passed and the GKR proof passed and everything is, works out. So this is high level, the idea of the basic blueprint of all implementation, of all the SNOGS implementation that are based on GKR. A, one thing I want to mention is, it was a Kalmit's question. Note this takes many rounds, uh, at least D rounds, actually D poly with time some poly log for the, for the sum check. A, uh, so when you, but this is a public coin protocol. So the verifiers messages are just random. Uh, for in practice, maybe one wants to use a fiat chamir on top of it to reduce interaction, okay? To make it non-interactive. Good, so, so, right. So the question is, does the analysis found? Actually, there's a very recent work by uh, Ran Canetti and his co-authors that they show that the analysis essentially does follow if you apply the Fiat Chamil on this protocol. Yeah, uh, yeah. And then in a very recent work with Omer and Lisa, we showed that you can also, um, 
a, a, use a different, like uh, bilinear mappings to, to reduce interaction, and as opposed to Fiat Jamil. Okay. Um, okay, so any question about this blu blueprint? Okay, so I want to say a little bit about uh, the way uh, people, you guys, uh, have implemented it. Uh, so the first thing is the shrinking uh, commitment. Uh, so, you know, I said one way to do it is, you know, to do a, a huge uh, tree, uh, um, uh, tree commitment and then, you know, to shrink it down. As Yuval said yesterday, uh, this uh, will be very inefficient. It seems weird to, you know, expand everything and then shrink everything. And indeed, in the uh, implementation, they use a different type of commitment called uh, polynomial commitments, which I don't want to get into, but uh, that's kind of uh, what's used in, in, in uh, the implementations. Also, uh, I said, you know, oh, you commit and then you do zero knowledge proof. If you just use any zero knowledge proof, it seems like it can be really inefficient. Uh, and the way uh, these things are implemented is with very specific uh, commitments and zero knowledge proofs. Um, in a very high level, they use kind of Pedersen commitment together with zero knowledge proof for specific, like they use Schnorr uh, type zero knowledge proof with fit together with the Pedersen type commitment. So uh, th there's a lot of kind of um, fine blueprints, you know, um, to get these things. Uh, uh, efficient and work well in practice. So there's been a lot of uh, very nice work about it. And uh, as, as I said, the very recent one uh, was just, uh, I think it's called Libra. And it was very, just put on ePrint like a few weeks ago. Uh, so, uh, so still kind of seems like an active area of research. Um, OK, so, so far, what did we see? So we saw that the GKR blueprint, even though it was designed or you know, we thought of it for just deterministic uh, computation with no secrecy, uh, it, it has been used to get succinct uh, zero knowledge proof uh, for NP. Okay? However, I want to mention that this is only for low depth computation. So again, the verifier runtime grows with the depth. And that's inherent. Even if you reduce rounds, uh, that's fine, but still, the way the GKR protocol works is there's a little component to go from layer to layer. And so the verifier always runs in time that's proportional to the depth here. Okay, so the next thing I, I want to talk to you about is how can you use GKR uh, blueprint to avoid this dependence on the depth. But any questions? Yes, Hugo. The low depth one? So yes, Sam, I'll, I'll show you one, yes. So uh, uh, I'll mention one work that I know that used the low depth. But I think most of the implementations, correct me, uh, Abby and uh, Justin, uh, were on the, with the depth rec uh, restriction. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so what is the depth that usually uh, that has been applied to in practice? In the, in the context of blockchain, what is the depth? Uh, But in blockchain applications, the depth would be large, or, or, or I guess it would be. I mean, so uh, even when the depth is quite small, the proofs are still like yeah. size. So I, still I think for blockchain application, you really want the proofs to be few group elements. The length is very important. It's not just the time. The length is much more important than the time. So for these applications, it seems like the pairing based are much much more uh, um, relevant than than this. Um, Okay, so okay, so now let me drive. Let, let me uh, whoop, uh, go forward and say how. What's the idea of eliminating the depth restriction in GKR? Okay, so any questions before I move forward? Okay, so what's the idea? The idea is okay. Take any computation and convert it, squash it to a low depth circuit. Okay, how how is this done? So take any computation, think of it as a Turing machine, okay? So take kind of the RAM machine, whatever model you like. So you start with an input X, you compute, 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 all the way up. Now, of course, this is very deep. It's, if you think of it as a Turing machine or a RAM machine, the depth is like the time. So, so what do you do? So if you run GKR on this thing, it'll be a disaster. The verifier will run like the time it takes to do the computation. Instead, we, 
The idea is squash the circuit. So how do you squash the circuit? Think, take all the configurations of the, your computation, think of that as your input. And now the circuit just checks consistency between the configurations. Okay, so the input is like all the configuration, and the, the um, circuit just says, yeah, from configuration C1 or, or X, you get to C1, from C1, you get to C2, and so on and so forth, until C out, and if everything verifies and consistent, you output one. Now, this is a very, very shallow circuit. Okay, it's a log uh, depth circuit, so now you can apply GKR. So it seems uh, uh, great. So now we're on GKR and the squash circuit, you'll only have logarithmic many layers, and wonderful. It's really a great idea. What is, uh, is the problem here? The problem is that, again, if you remember how GKR works, the prover uh, kind of, uh, at, the end, at, sorry, at the end of the GKR protocol, the verifier needs to verify on his own that some element is in, in the uh, uh, encoding of the input is true. But now how does he know? He doesn't know these C1, uh, these all the configurations. So he can't check on his own whether, uh, you know, he can't compute on his own an element in the, in, in the encoding of the input. He doesn't know the input. The input is the entire computation. So it seems like we didn't make any progress here. However, uh, okay, so, so this is the problem. However, we can use, so how is this done? We can really use the same idea as before. Oh, but actually before I, I, I go there, I want to mention, so uh, Hugo, to your, your question, uh, whether it's been Im implemented for, for a, a squashed. So there is a paper uh, uh, by Justin and, and his co-authors where they implemented this, but in a two uh, prover model. So they have one prover who kind of holds us to this input layer and the other prover who helps you in the GKR. So in this model, it has been implemented. But I don't know if it was implemented in the one prover model. I assume yeah, no. You, the second prover gives you a polymorphism. Exactly. So now, okay, good. So it was implemented in the two prover model. But now I want to say I think you guys should implement it in the one prover model. Okay? So let me tell you how. And maybe it's not a good idea, but maybe, you know, three minutes, got it. But maybe it's I'm at the end. So but maybe it is a good idea. So here's the, the idea. So first you can think of it as an interactive PCP, exactly as before. The prover gives the low degree extension of, instead of the witness, this now, think of the, all the computation as the witness. So it gives a low degree extension of this huge witness, which is all the computation, and, and you do, and exactly as before, you run GKR and you do a low degree test. Exactly as before. This is, for those who are familiar, this is exactly an interactive version of the BFLS PCP. Okay, so it's kind of a more efficient ver way to do BFLS um, PCP. Okay, but we saw that you can convert that to a succinct argument. So I want to end this talk by saying here's a way to use GKR to get, rid of, to get zero knowledge, succinct arguments without the depth issue. How do you do it? The prover first commits via this polynomial, these efficient polynomial commitments to, uh, to the low degree extension of just the entire computation. And then you run GKR on it, but in a zero knowledge way, so with commitments. And at the end, the verifier will send also a message for the low degree test, and uh, the prover gives a zero knowledge proof of knowledge that the low degree uh, test passes and that the GKR proof accepts. So it's exactly the same idea of going from interactive PCP, uh, what I wrote, IPCP, to a succinct uh, a zero knowledge argument. And this is without any. Uh, now, this protocol has no depth restriction and, uh, uh, because it's, uh, the protocol is squashed. Okay. So if anybody is, uh, would implement this and let me know what the results are, I would be very, very, very happy. Okay. I'll end with that. Thank you. Good questions while uh, well, Ali is setting up. Any questions? Yes, Daniele. You said that uh, you wanted to get a modular way to do all of this. Uh, right. So does it mean that now people can implement these things taking pieces that have already been implemented and putting them together? This, this would be better. Right. Right. Can. Yes. So, so for example, if one implemented the interactive PCP version, then up, now all you need to do is kind of put commitments on top and zero knowledge proof. 
So it seems like, yeah, it should be helpful, right? I'm not an implementer myself, so maybe what I'm saying makes no sense. I don't know. Yeah, that actually I don't know. That's a question to the experts, to Justin or Abby or, yeah. Okay. Some comments on that suggestion? Yeah. So I think it's quite reasonable and I think the main part to use there is this multivariate polynomial commitments that uh, save you the fact that uh, if you don't use them, then uh, the read I mean, the read Muller code yes, has sub-constant rate. I do. Yeah. Yes. So you have to use some polynomial commitments. Otherwise, I think it's like a like it should work out. Yeah. Yes. So please.